Why may I not become a famous knight? He spurred Rosiante into a sturdy trot and was soon right in the midst of the windmill. Good sir, let me go home to my wife and children. They soon discovered the knight sitting quietly upon a rock. He was pale and almost starved. Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra was a Spanish writer widely regarded as the greatest writer in the Spanish language and one of the world's preeminent novelists. He is best known for his novel Don Quixote, a work often cited as both the first modern novel and one of the pinnacles of world literature. This novel influenced many famous novelists, like Dickens, Flaubert, Melville and Dostoevsky. He who loses wealth loses much. He who loses a friend loses more. But he that loses his courage loses all. Now let's get started. Many years ago there lived in Spain a very old-fashioned gentleman. His name was Don Quixote. He was gentle and kind, and very brave. All who knew him loved him. He had neither wife nor child and lived with his niece in his own farmhouse. He was more than 50 years of age, and quite tall and slender. He did so many strange things that he was very famous throughout the country. In his room there was a rusty sword, and leaning against the wall were a rusty lance and a big rawhide shield. These weapons had belonged to his grandfather, when men knew but little about guns and gunpowder. In the stable, there was a horse as old and as lean as his master. Like many other gentlemen, he did not work much. He spent almost all his time in reading and reading and reading. He often forgot his meals. He read no histories nor books of travel. He cared nothing for poetry or philosophy. His whole mind was given to stories, stories of knights and their daring deeds. One day this old-fashioned gentleman said to himself, why should I always be a plain farmer and sit here at home? Why may I not become a famous knight? The more he thought about this matter the more he wished to be a hero like those of whom he had read in his books. Yes, I will be a knight, he said to himself. My mind is fully made up. I will arm myself in a coat of mail. I will mount my steed. I will ride out into the world to seek adventures. So he began at once to get ready for his great undertaking. In the garret of his house there was an old coat of mail. It had lain there among the dust for a hundred years and more. He cleaned it as well as he could, and polished it with great care. To be prepared as half the victory. And now a steed must be provided. For every knight must have a noble horse. The poor old horse in the stable was thin and bony, but he was just the stuff for a war horse. As Don Quixote looked at him he fancied that no steed had ever been so beautiful or so swift. He spent four days in studying what he should call his steed. At last he said, I have it. His name shall be Rosiante. But I have no squire, said he. There lived in the village a poor man whose name was Sancho Panza. He was honest but poor in brains. One day Don Quixote said to him, El am a knight, and I shall soon ride out on a knightly errand. How fine it will be, said the man. I think I shall conquer an island in one of my adventures. If you are with me, I will give it to you. You shall be its governor, said Don Quixote. Well, if you will give me an island, I'll go with you. In all the stories he had read, every knight had some fair lady. It was at her feet that the knight must kneel at the end of every adventure. Don Quixote was not acquainted with many ladies. But at length he remembered a beautiful maiden who lived in the village of Toboso. Many years ago she had smiled at him as he was passing her on the road. He had not seen her since she had grown up, but she must now be the most charming of womankind. Her name shall be Lady Dulcinea, no other name is so sweet, said he. One morning in summer, Don Quixote arose very early, long before anyone else was awake. He took down the short sword that had been his grandfather's, and belted it to his side. 
He grasped his lance, and swung the leather shield upon his shoulder. The knight and squire stole silently away from the village without bidding goodbye to anyone. The two travelers rode onward across the plains, and both were silent, for they had high purposes in view. At length Sancho Panza spoke. I beseech you, Sir Knight Errant, be sure to remember the island you promised me. Don Quixote answered with becoming dignity. Friend Sancho, you must know that it has always been the custom of knights errant to conquer islands and put their squires over them as governors. Now it is my intention to keep up that good custom. You are indeed a rare master, said Sancho Panza. Well, I am thinking I might even improve upon that good custom, said Don Quixote. What if I should conquer three or four islands and set you up as master of them all? You could do nothing that would please better, answered Sancho. While they were thus riding and talking, they came to a place where there were a great many windmills. There seemed to be thirty or forty of them scattered here and there upon the plain. And when the wind blew, their long white arms seemed to wave. Don Quixote drew rein and paused in the middle of the road. There, there, he cried. Look there, Sancho. I see at least thirty huge giants, and I intend to fight all of them. What giants? asked Sancho Panza. Why, those who are standing in the fields just before us, answered the knight. See their long arms. I have read that some of their race had arms which reached more than two miles. Look at them better, master, said Sancho. Those are not giants, they are windmills. The things which you call arms are sails, and they flap around when the wind blows. Friend Sancho, said the knight, very sternly, it is plain that you are not used to adventures. I tell you those things are giants. If you are afraid, go and hide yourself and say your prayers. I shall attack them at once. He who loses wealth loses much. He who loses a friend loses more, but he that loses his courage loses all. Without another word he spurred Rosiante into a sturdy trot and was soon right in the midst of the windmill. At that moment the wind began to blow and all the mill sails were set moving. They seemed to be answering his challenge. Then he couched his lance. He covered himself with his shield. He rushed with Rosiante's utmost speed upon the nearest windmill. The long lance struck into one of the whirling sails and was carried upward. It was whirled into the air and broken into shivers. At the same moment the knight and his steed were hurled forward and thrown rolling upon the ground. Sancho Panza hurried to the place as quickly as his donkey could carry him. His master was lying helpless by the roadside. The helmet had fallen from his head, and the shield had been hurled to the farther side of the hedge. Mercy on me, master, cried the squire. Didn't I tell you they were windmills? Peace, friend Sancho, answered Don Quixote, rubbing the dust from his eyes. There is nothing so uncertain as war. That wicked enchanter, Preston, who stole my books has done all this. They were giants, as I told you. But he changed them into windmills so that I should not have the honor of victory. But mind you, Sancho, I will get even with him in the end. Sancho dismounted from his donkey, and lifted the fallen knight from the ground. He brought his shield and adjusted his helmet. Then he led his unlucky steed to his side and helped him to remount. The sun was now sloping towards the west, and knight and squire rode thoughtfully onward across the plain. One day as they passed the crest of a hill, they saw a great cloud of dust rising in the road at some distance below them. Don Quixote's eyes flashed with excitement as he watched it. The day has come, Sancho, he cried. The day has come that shall bring us good fortune and happiness. Now I shall perform, an, exploit that will be remembered through the ages. Don't you see that cloud of dust, Sancho? I see it, brave master, answered the squire.
Well, that dust is raised by an army that is marching this way, said Don Quixote. It is a mighty army made up of many nations. Our duty is plain, answered the knight. What ought we to do but aid the weaker and injured side? Sancho cried, Not a man nor a knight can I see either in this cloud of dust or in that. Indeed, answered Don Quixote, but don't you hear their horses neigh, their trumpets sound, their drums beat? Not I, said Sancho. I open my ears very wide, and I hear nothing but the bleeding of sheep. And now the flock was drawing very near to them, and the sheep could not only be heard, but plainly seen. Then he couched his lance, set spurs to Rizionte, and rushed onward like a thunderbolt to meet the nearest flock. Sancho Panza looked him in amazement. Come back, sir, he cried. Are you mad? Those are sheep, and neither pagans nor Christians. Come back, I say. But Don Quixote did not hear him. He rode forward furiously. Courage, brave knights, he shouted. March up, fall on, the victory is ours. In order to attain the impossible, one must attempt the absurd. The men who were driving the sheep called out to him, but he would not listen. He rushed madly this way and that. The sheep were trampled upon in a most terrible manner. Where is the general of this army? cried Don Quixote. The shepherds were now greatly alarmed. They ran forward and began to throw stones at the knight. Some of these, as big as a man's fist, flew close about his ears. Some fell upon his shield, and others struck the back and sides of unhappy Rizionte. Where is the general? he cried again. But just at that moment a stone struck him in the side with such force as almost to break his ribs. He fell from his horse and lay upon the ground as though dead. The shepherds got their flocks together and hurried away with all speed. Sancho hastened to his aid. Ah, master, he cried, this comes of not taking my advice. Did I not tell you that it was a flock of sheep and no army? Don Quixote groaned and sat up. Friend Sancho, he said, it is an easy matter for enchanters to change the shapes of things as they please. Sancho helped his master to climb again upon the back of gentle Rizionte, and then he remounted his donkey. My trusty Sancho, go ahead, said Don Quixote. I will follow you. Sancho obeyed, and led the way, keeping to the road which passed over the hills. Day after day, the two travelers rode along, rambling here and there wherever they want to wander. See there, master, said Sancho. See those poor fellows who are being taken away to serve the king in the galleys. Why are they being treated in that ugly fashion? Asked Don Quixote, reigning in his steed. Well, they are rogues, was the answer. They have broken the law and been caught at it. They are now on their way to the king's galleys to be punished. If that is the case, said Don Quixote, they shall have my help. For I am sworn to hinder violence and oppression. But these wicked wretches are not oppressed, said Sancho. They are only getting what they deserve. Don Quixote was not satisfied. At any rate, they are in trouble, he answered. Soon the chain of prisoners had come up. Pray, sir, said Don Quixote to one of the mounted men who was captain of the guards. Why are these people led along in that manner? They are criminals, answered the captain. They have been condemned to serve the king in his galleys. I have no more to say to you. Well, I should like to know what each one has done, said Don Quixote. I can't talk with you, said the captain. But while they rest here at the top of the hill, you may ask the rogues themselves, if you wish. Don Quixote was much pleased. He rode up to the chain and began to question the men. Why were you condemned to the galleys, my good fellow? He asked one of the men. Oh, only for being in love, was the careless answer. Indeed, cried Don Quixote. If all who are in love must be sent to the galleys, what will become of us? 
True enough, said the prisoner. But my love was not of the common kind. I was so in love with a basket of clothes that I took it in my arms and carried it home. I was accused of stealing it, and here I am. Don Quixote then turned to another. And what have you done, my honest man? He asked. Why are you in this sad case? I will tell you, answered the man. I am here for the lack of two gold pieces to pay an honest debt. Well, well, that is too bad, said the knight. I will give you four gold pieces and set you free. Thus Don Quixote went from one prisoner to another, asking each to tell his history. By this time the guards had given the command and the human chain was again toiling slowly along over the hill. Gentlemen of the guard, I am the renowned Don Quixote. I command you to release these poor men. If you refuse, then know that this lance, this sword, and this invincible arm will force you to yield. That's a good joke said the captain of the guard. Now set your basin right on top of your empty head, and go about your business. This made Don Quixote very angry. And he charged upon him so suddenly and furiously that the captain had no time to defend himself, but was tumbled headlong and helpless into the mud the other guards hurried to the rescue. They attacked Don Quixote with their swords and clubs. And he, wheeling Rizionte around, defended himself with his heavy lance. Seeing the confusion and wishing to give aid to his master, Sancho leapt from his donkey, and, running up to one of the prisoners, began to unfasten his irons. The conflict which now followed was dreadful. The guards had enough to do to defend themselves from the wild thrusts of Don Quixote's lance. They seemed to lose their senses, so great was the uproar. The prisoners soon freed themselves from their irons, and the guards were routed. They fled with all speed down the highway, followed by a shower of stones from the prisoners. The prisoners with one accord fell upon the knight, dragged him from his steed, and threw him upon the ground. They stripped him of his coat and even robbed him of his long black stockings. They scattered in different directions, and the donkey, Rizionte, Sancho Panza, and Don Quixote were left the miserable masters of the field. They were sorry masters, every one of them. Friend Sancho, said Don Quixote, rising from the muddy road, there is a proverb which I want you to remember. It is this. One might as well throw water into the sea as do a kindness to clowns. A proverb is a short sentence based on long experience. He rode silently and thoughtfully onward into the heart of the Black Mountains. And Sancho Panza, on his donkey, followed him. In the darkness of night, our two travelers were in the midst of the mountains. The sky was clear, and above the treetops the moon was shining. Both knight and squire were weary from long traveling, and sore from the beating which they had received from the thieves. Here we are, at length cried Sancho, pulling up his donkey by the side of a big rock. Here we are, master. There is a pleasant place. Let us stay here till morning. Truly, I am willing, said Don Quixote. Both men were so tired that they did not want to get down from their steeds. They sat quietly in their saddles, thinking, and soon both were fast asleep. Don Quixote sat upright, but Sancho doubled himself over upon the pommel of his saddle, and snored as peacefully as though he were on a feather bed. It chanced about midnight that the thief came to this very spot, seeking the best way to escape from the forest. It would be easy enough to tumble him off and take his steed by force, said the thief, talking to himself. But the poor fellow did me a good turn today. And I don't like to disturb his slumbers. The cunning thief smiled at his own ingenuity. He placed one end of each of his four poles under a corner of the saddle, the other end resting firmly upon the ground. The thief led the donkey out from under, leaving the saddle and Sancho high up in the air. It was a funny sight, there in the still light of the moon, and the cunning man looked back and laughed. 
He then threw himself upon the donkey bareback and rode joyfully. Where is your donkey, friend Sancho? Don Quixote asked, looking quickly around. My donkey gone. Some thief has led him away in the night, and left me nothing but four sticks and the saddle. Thief, indeed, said Don Quixote. It was no thief. Those same wicked enchanters have done it. They have changed the poor beast into four sticks. And now you will have to walk until we learn how to remove the enchantment and change the sticks back to a donkey. Sancho Panza was sorely distressed. He looked at the saddle and at the sticks, and then at the tracks which the donkey had left in the dust of the road. Tears came to his eyes, and he broke out into the saddest cry that ever was heard. Oh, my donkey! Oh, dear one! You were the playfellow of my children, the comfort of my wife, the envy of my neighbors. And now, you are gone, you are gone! Oh, my donkey! How can I live without you? Don Quixote's kind heart was touched. Never mind, dear Sancho, he said. Dry your tears. I have five donkeys at home. And I will give you three of them. This generous offer turned Sancho's grief into joy. It dried his tears. It hushed his cries. It changed his moans to smiles and thanks. You were always a good master, he said. Then Knight and Squire sat down together on the ground and ate some bits of dry bread. All sorrows are less with bread. And they resumed their journey through the mountains. Don Quixote rode in advance, and Sancho followed slowly with the donkey saddle astride of his shoulders. All day long Don Quixote and his squire toiled wearily and slowly through the wildest part of the mountains. Sancho Panza, with the saddle on his shoulders, trudged silently at the heels of Rizionte, and was very tired. Good sir, let me go home to my wife and children. I want to see them. I tell you, this tramping over hills and valleys, by night and by day, is too hard for me. I cannot endure it. Friend Sancho, I understand you, answered Don Quixote, but listen to me, I have a plan to tell you. Then he explained to the squire that it was his intention to send him at once to Toboso to carry a letter to the Lady Dulcinea. I will write it immediately, said Don Quixote. And please, sir, said Sancho, do not forget to write that order to your niece for those three donkeys which you promised me. Sancho took the letter and put it carefully in his waistcoat pocket. Now you may start at any time said Don Quixote, and as you are very poor at walking, you may take Rizionte with you. He will carry you with great safety and speed. Very well, master, said Sancho, but what will you do while I am gone? Oh, you need not go to any trouble about it, said Don Quixote. But tell me, good master, said Sancho, what will you do for food when I am gone? Don't worry about that. Sancho, said his master. I shall eat the herbs and fruits of the forest, and want nothing more. While there's life there's hope. Be good to the noble steed, said Don Quixote. Remember to be as kind to him as you have been to his master. Indeed, I will not forget, said Sancho. Don Quixote watched him until a turn of the road hid him from sight. Then he wandered into the wildest part of the woods to seek another adventure. To dream the impossible dream, that is my quest. The next day as Sancho Panza was traveling slowly along the highway, he came to a little inn. Presently, two men came out, and when they saw him at the gate, they paused. Then one said to the other, Look there, isn't that Sancho Panza? Surely it is said the other, and he rides Don Quixote's horse. Now these two men were the curate and the barber of Don Quixote's own village. They knew more than anyone else about the man's malady. They were now going through the country in search of him, for they wished to persuade him to return to the care of his family and friends. Where is your master, Sancho? Where is Don Quixote? 
they asked. My master has engaged himself in some important business of his own, answered Sancho. I don't know where my master is at this moment, but I left him in yonder mountain, knocking his head against the trees, tearing up rocks, and doing a thousand queer things. Then he told the whole story, adding to it a great many fanciful touches of his own. And now, he said, I am on my way to Toboso, where I mean to give my master's letter into the hands of Lady Dulcinea. Let us see the letter, said the barber. Sancho put his hand into his pocket to get the letter. But he could not find it. It had slipped through a hole in his pocket and was lost in the dust of the highway. He turned pale, and his hands trembled. Then he began to stamp like a madman. He tore his beard. Why need you be so angry, Sancho? Asked the curate, kindly. What is the matter? I deserve the worst beating in the world. He answered. For I have lost three donkeys which were as good as three castles. I have lost the letter to Dulcinea. And I also lost an order on Don Quixote's niece for three of his five donkeys. Then with tears and sobs, the poor man told them how he had recently lost his own donkey. Cheer up, Sancho, said the curate. We are going to find your master. What concerns us now is to find your master and persuade him to give up his mad projects. So, come into the inn with us, and we'll talk it over while we eat dinner. Presently a dish of hot meat was sent out to him, and he feasted as if he had not feasted for many a day. Hunger is the best sauce in the world. The curate and the barber came riding out from the inn yard, ready to begin the journey. They finally reached the place where Sancho left Don Quixote behind. It was right about here that I left him, Sancho said. And sure enough, they soon discovered the knight sitting quietly upon a rock. He was pale and almost starved, and Sancho could hear him sighing sorrowfully and muttering the name of the Lady Dulcinea. The curate and the barber were so disguised that Don Quixote did not know them. By the ingenious trick, they induced Don Quixote to put his armor again and ride out of the forest. At first, all went well, for he was persuaded that he was going to the aid of a fair princess whom a tyrant had driven from her kingdom. Come on, he cried, as he mounted Rosiante, let us all go together for the rescue of this unfortunate lady. They set out, the curate and the barber being disguised and unknown to their poor friends. The man who fights for his ideals is the man who is alive. The next day, when the party was well out of the mountains, they suddenly saw at a turn in the road, a stranger riding slowly along at a little distance ahead. He was mounted upon a small donkey. Sancho Panza's eyes opened very wide, for at the first glance he knew that the donkey was his own long-lost dapple. The next moment he was running to overtake the thief and the donkey, and Sancho was soon beside them. Get off from the back of my dear donkey, shouted he. Away from my dapple. He had no need to use so many words. For the thief, seeing several men so close upon him, dismounted quickly and took to his heels. No doubt he thought that the king's officers were after him, for he bounded into the woods, and was soon out of sight. My treasure, my darling, my dear dapple. Is it possible that I have you again? How have you been since I saw you last? He cried. The rest of the company rejoiced at the squire's good fortune, and Don Quixote said, I am glad that you have found your donkey, Sancho, but it shall make no difference with the order. My niece will give you the three donkeys, just the same. I thank you, sir, said Sancho. You are always a kind master. They were still far from their home village, and Don Quixote's malady grew worse every day. At length, the curate and the barber were forced to find some other plan by which to carry him home. They stopped at an inn. Late in the evening, as he lay quietly sleeping in his room, a number of strangely dressed men opened the door and stole in. They had masks on their faces, 
They wore long, white robes and their appearance was very frightful indeed. They were the curate and the barber and the other guests of the inn, but they were so disguised that not even Sancho could have guessed who they were. When Don Quixote saw the white-robed figure standing by his bedside, he sat up very quietly, and said not a word. He felt sure that he was now in an enchanted castle, and that these figures were ghosts and hobgoblins. He knew that it was useless to fight with such creatures. Therefore he quietly gave himself up, and made no resistance. The ghosts lifted him out of bed. Then they carried him out and put him in the wooden cage which stood ready at the door. The ox cart was waiting in the courtyard of the inn. The men lifted the cage upon it very gently and shut it fast. The wagoner cracked his whip, and the oxen began to move slowly towards the great gate. Don Quixote was not altogether displeased. In all my books, I never read of a knight errant being drawn in a slow-moving ox cart, he said. Having said this, he became very quiet, and did not speak again for a long time. It was about noon of the sixth day when they reached their home village. It was Sunday, and nearly all the people were on the street. When the ox cart was seen, it was at once surrounded by a crowd of men and boys. All wanted to know what kind of beast it was. What was their surprise, however, when they saw no beast at all, but only their honored neighbor and friend. Don Quixote was lying on the hay and taking but little notice of anything around him. The village seemed strange to him, and the faces of his friends were unknown and unrecognized. The ox cart reached the door of Don Quixote's house. The curate and the barber lifted the poor knight from his bed of hay, and carried him into his own room. He was as helpless as a child, and neither spoke nor attempted to move. The housekeeper and the niece undressed him and put him in his old bed. He lay there, looking at them curiously. Their faces seemed altogether strange to him. He could not imagine where he was. One by one, the good man's neighbors and friends returned to their homes. Sancho Panza, with his donkey, went back to his own dwelling. And Don Quixote once more slept quietly beneath his own roof. The pen is the tongue of the soul. Please subscribe to my channel. We're gonna show you world masterpieces in about 15 minutes with manga. Manga is Japanese style comics that is easy for everyone to understand. We're sure that you can grasp the context shortly. See you next time. Please subscribe to my channel. We're gonna show you world masterpieces in about 15 minutes with manga. Manga is Japanese style comics that is easy for everyone to understand. We're sure that you can grasp the context shortly. See you next time. Please subscribe to my channel. We're gonna show you world masterpieces in about 15 minutes with manga. Manga is Japanese style comics that is easy for everyone to understand. We're sure that you can grasp the context shortly. See you next time.